Hey, everybody, we're going to get started in just a moment, but uh, as we get on our way, uh, uh, I'm Jack. Uh, it's good to see you all again. And I have with me today uh, Emily Tang, who's a product manager and leads a lot of our innovation products. Uh, and we'll um, talk about some of the insights that we've gathered from a couple of our tools over the last year about how uh, innovation has happened in the age of coronavirus. Uh, and then Linda Ashbrook, who is uh, part of the team here as well. And uh, Linda was formerly Director of Insights at Taco Bell and has done a ton of work and is perhaps one of the most knowledgeable people in the industry around chain menu innovation and process. And we're gonna talk about some of the processes that we should all be following right now as we bring great new ideas to life. Um, so as we get started, uh, I, I feel silly for doing this every single uh, couple of weeks, but we got to do it. Uh, it. This thing is just as much about you and the community and your thoughts and ideas that you're willing to share with all the rest of us and just the hellos and hey, here's where I'm, uh, where I'm clicking in from, um, as it is about the content. So uh, please hit that chat button. Let us know who you are, where you're chatting in from. Say hi to all your colleagues across the food industry. And when you do it, choose either all panelists and attendees, or maybe the option in Zoom says everyone. I'm not really sure what it says anymore, but don't just choose panelists, because if you do that, only the three of us get to see your comments. Choose either everyone or all panelists and attendees and share more broadly. Uh, okay, and uh, I'm gonna bring in Mike now as well. Uh, do you guys see Mike on the list anywhere? Mike, I'm gonna bring you in too. So Mike is our trendologist and hopefully we'll see him joining us up. Oh, there we go. Okay, well, as a reminder, uh, we are still publishing, Data Central still publishing brand new COVID insights um, every week, uh, usually a report, a traffic update, uh, uh, you know, what the latest rules are around um, what can be open and how much it can be open. Make sure you visit datacentral.com slash coronavirus for the latest. And uh, Mike, I think we got you. Uh, can you hear us okay? I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can hear you fantastically. Oh, fantastic. And uh, nice. with, with that, maybe we can get this week going. And the first question is just, what is going on in the world? I know you sent over a couple of things that you wanted to share. So I'm going to turn the floor over to you, Mike. Sure, yeah. So the first one, I just thought this was interesting because we had talked about the cruise ship that was adding the robot bartender. Um, I think that was about a month back. And then a couple weeks ago, Nestle actually launched this AI interface, which, um, so this is a platform, her name is Ruth. Um, it's based on Ruth Wakefield, the person that invented the chocolate chip cookie. Um, it's developed with a New Zealand startup that actually makes these AI avatars. And so you speak to this avatar in the same way that we're speaking right now. So you ask her questions, you ask her, you know, what's the recipe for a Nestle Toll House cookie? You can ask her, you know, I wanna make a softer one, I wanna make a crunchier one, I'd like to lower the sugar content. And she interacts with you based on what you're saying. I would encourage everybody uh, after this is over to jump on and just kind of experience it. It is kind of surreal uh, just to have this conversation with a pretty lifelike um, AI interface. They said the reason that they did it is because they were finding that people who were calling in um, to their helpline were having inconsistent experiences. Um, you know, the people on the helpline, I think, had various um, levels of expertise when it comes to baking. So this let them kind of uh, offer that consistent experience um, across people. So does it sort of animate live sort of on the fly or is it sort mm -hmm. of recorded messages that it plays back to you? No, yeah, it animates on the fly. And, you know, I think we're going to see this more in the future. I think, um, you know, the Butterball hotline around Thanksgiving, you would probably see something like this. And then like far off in the future, if you look at some of these deep fake technologies. So I know we've talked about the Tom Cruise deep fakes where, you know, it yep. is a fake video, but it looks just like Tom Cruise talking. Um, you could probably actually talk to, um, you know, what looks like a real Ruth Wakefield in the future as well. Uh, amazing. Uh, yeah, let's, <laughs> let's definitely all go try this. Uh, what's going on here? Um, oh, so, I, you know, this is interesting. It's um, very new. So it actually hasn't even launched yet outside of these couple of chefs that are on the screen here. But, you know, we're seeing all of these kind of private communities pop up. So whereas for a long time, social media 
um, was focused on, you know, large communities, Twitter, Facebook, you know, getting as many people as possible. Now we see things like Clubhouse and, you know, more private communities. And this is kind of like that, but this is for chefs. So for $10 a month, you can pay to be a part of a social community with a particular chef. Um, it's a closed community. It tends to be a smaller group of people um, and it's surrounding various um, you know, cuisines or issues or parts of the industry that you may be interested in. So if you're interested in Chinese cuisine, maybe there's a great um, Chinese chef in your community. You can pay 10 bucks a month, you're in a WhatsApp community with that person and other like-minded people, they'll send you recipes. If you have questions about what you're making for dinner that night, you know, they'll send you ideas for it. They pull in other people in the industry that they know. So, you know, I know in the past they've said like, you know, oh, let me call up, you know, somebody like Rachel Ray and she can answer your question for you. Um, so I, I actually am really interested in doing this when it launches. I know Sean Sherman, who was um, one of our keynote speakers at Foodscape a couple of years ago, is going to be a part of the community. And it just kind of speaks to what we talked about when we talked about the 2021 trends, which is that personalization of the chef and, you know, kind of the evolution of what the role of the chef is going to be in the future. And this is not just for restaurants and chefs. This is for many different types of fields, right? Or is it? Um, no, right now it's actually only for, for chefs in the food community. Oh, that's sort of interesting. Aren't we seeing like uh, some of these platforms do more to sort of monetize uh, like members, right? Uh, didn't Twitter announce that they're going to allow people to have paid paid access now too? Yes, way? yeah. And it's a little bit like Patreon too. So if you see some of the, yeah. you know, the uh, personalities out there that have Patreon subscriptions and you get access to special content. It's a little bit like that. From the chef perspective as well, the, all the chefs say they love it. They love talking to people on a more one-on-one -on -one, uh, basis, hearing what they're eating, hearing what they're thinking about, um, that it also kind of informs what they're putting on the menu as well. What, um, what percentage of your day, Mike, would you guess is spent online right now? Where oh, the primary um, thing you're doing is engaging with the screen. Uh, ooh, good question. I mean, like, obviously working from home, you know, the, like, you know, if you're, if you're going for a walk and you have, you know, you're streaming music that I wouldn't count that, but where the okay. primary thing you're doing is looking at a screen and interacting in some way. Mm -hmm. Is that I don't know, 10, 12 hours a day? Like more than half your waking life. Easily. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that's probably true for most of us. Uh, it's sort of terrifying. Say, a good yeah. question would be, who, what percentage of us do you think would underrepresent how much screen time we actually <laughs> actually do imagine if instead of a, a global sort of you know live you know biological virus in the pandemic what if we had like a global computer virus that just knocked all of our screens out for a year what would that have been like i mean there's a couple books about that that have come out recently make them make them true uh okay, this <laughs> is confusing to me uh oh, wait, yeah. actually, before, wait, wait, before you tell us what it is i want yeah. emily and linda to try to guess i know what this <laughs> is you do yeah. And it's the reason why I know this is what this is because of a shameful admission, which is that I saw it on TikTok. <laughs> Good, yes. Did you make it? I'm so embarrassed, but it's real. Like, so it's, it's, so don't don't tell list. us yet. So for those of you uh, chatting in, uh, does anyone in chat know what this is? Anyone care to make a guess? We have any... Lots of people have already. Yeah, there's tons coming up. Know it. So people actually admit to being TikTok. <laughs> I don't know if everybody found out about it on TikTok. That's where I learned about it. Yeah, now it's spread far beyond TikTok. You don't even have to be. I will say I went to the grocery store and tried to get the thing that you're looking at in the middle and it was sold out. Sold out, yes. yes. And I think that's what's so interesting about it is I know they said Harris Teeter stores, it was sold out across the country. Um, the buyer for, I believe it was Kroger, um, said that this is the most sustained interest in a product that they've seen in their entire experience working um, in the cheese department at Kroger. Look at, look at the comments. This is yeah. great. You can use cream cheese. You can use borsin. There's all kinds of, this is great. <laughs> so did you make it, Emily? Because I, like I've heard mixed reviews of like, if it's good or not. I haven't made it because I couldn't get the ingredients. You still can't find it, really? Well, there was, I tried it a couple weeks ago. I haven't I tried it. What, this is. What, what am I looking at? I so oh, this sorry. is a recipe that, yeah, so it's actually a Finnish blogger created this recipe 
quite a few years ago. And then for whatever reason, just recently on TikTok, it became this TikTok phenomenon and everybody was making it. Um, I think there was something like 600 million views of the feta pasta, um, you know, trend. And it is, I mean, it's just a really easy recipe that uses a block of feta, cherry tomatoes, um, pasta. Usually there's other ingredients, garlic, you see um, roasted red pepper flakes on here. Um, and it couldn't be easier. You just bake it all together and then you mix it up at the end. So it's an easy recipe, something the whole family likes, comfort food. And then it just kind of went out of control. It's been on the Today Show. It's been on Good Morning America. Uh, now you see it, you know, on Instagram and Facebook. And yeah, I mean, there's feta shortages across the country. <laughs> feta suppliers are saying they're increasing the amount of feta that they're making. Uh, I mean, I think it just goes to show you how TikTok um, has grown so fast and is really driving some of uh, so many of these trends. Now. The point is, we're going to see many more of these things. Oh right? yeah, it's all going to be very, very short, very, very short lived, but we're going to come in rapid succession. There's been others, a couple others. I can't think of any right this minute. There was an avocado or something or other, but yeah, recipes that get like, um, that they put on TikTok and these super short, and these super short videos to show you how to make it. And it's like so intuitive and easy. It's like- it's And the last one was that tortilla where you put like four different ingredients in four quadrants of a tortilla, and then you fold it over. We actually yeah, wrote about this I in Trend Watch last month. I feel like that was the precursor to this. The problem is you're all finding out way too much about what I do in my spare time now. Yeah, and Emily, my TikTok thing that I want to try is table nachos. So that just shows how yep. oh, at the yeah. other end of the culinary <laughs> spectrum I am. Okay, how about this? Who wants this? I love this idea. I would do this no problem. You would get on an airplane not knowing where you're going and just... Absolutely, it'd be super fun. So... Do they tell you when you're coming back or are they just going to end up someplace and it's good luck? No, yeah, I think they give you basic information. I think they tell you like what kind of clothes <laughs> you should bring. Uh, and it's not like they don't just take you to the other side of the world. It's not like super far away. Huh. Okay, cool. Well, um, <laughs> we have some other things going on too. And I feel like uh, we should at least talk a little bit about what's happened with, uh, with stimulus and what that means for the restaurant industry. So uh, I will say, I think none of the four of us are particular experts on politics or the, the legal aspects of what's in the stimulus bill. So if any of you uh, are experts or know anything, uh, please share it in the chat. But I will um, cover uh, the few things that we were able to uncover that we thought were important to know. So there's tw about $29 billion of relief that's been um, cut out for restaurants in this latest stimulus package. It's for restaurants, bars, uh, caterers, and food trucks, and, and places that we'd basically call a uh, traditional food service type of outlet. Um, to qualify, uh, you cannot have more than 20 units, and you can't be publicly traded. But if, as long as um, you know, uh, you're not that, um, there's a good chance that you'll qualify. Here's the interesting thing. It looks like it covers the difference in your revenue as a restaurant um, between what you made in 2019 top line and what 2020 looked like for you, right? So this is uh, an actual revenue adjustment. If you made uh, a, a million dollars of revenue in 2019 and in 2020 you had $200,000 of revenue, for my reading of it, it means that you qualify for an $800,000 grant potentially to just completely make up that difference. And the amounts, uh, the limits that have been put on this are $5 million per location or $10 million in total for your entity if you have multiple locations. That is sort of interesting though, right? There's not a lot of restaurants that do anywhere near $5 million of business a year, right? A lot of restaurants do four or $500,000 uh, of business, for instance. So the per location number um, seems pretty high, pretty generous, uh, but we'll talk about what the possible ramifications of that might be. Uh, and also this does not stack with PPP, meaning that if you've gotten PPP money, um, that's sort of deducted from your eligible amount. So you could get both PPP and this, but the cumulative total um, should not exceed what's allowable in this particular formula. Um, so the way it breaks out is that 28.6 billion 
5 billion of that is reserved um, for businesses with less than 500K in revenue. Uh, the majority of it, about 23 and change billion, is uh, awarded via grants that are awarded by an administrator. And if you um, uh, read the text of the bill, uh, I would actually invite everyone to do it. I didn't read the entire bill, but I read uh, a good chunk of it and specifically um, all the stuff that's related to, to restaurants. Um, it does say that uh, the grants that are being awarded uh, will be prioritized for businesses, you know, restaurants that are owned by women, uh, veterans, uh, racial and ethnic minorities, and other socially disadvantaged groups. So I'd imagine this is not going to be without um, some uh, political conversation and maybe a little bit of uh, controversy in how this is handled. And the thing to keep in mind is if you look at what happened with the restaurant industry last year, um, there's a really great tool that's available via IFMA. IFMA is the Food Service Manufacturers Association. We work with them and a company called Kinetic 12 to build this thing called the Operator Landscape, which lets you look at all these different um, uh, elements of the industry. You know, what was revenue? How much did consumers spend? Was it up? Was it down? What percentage of the industry of that particular food service segment is chain versus independent? Um, all sorts of stuff, right? And you can sort of customize and there's like many different views that you can look at. But if you look at restaurants last year, the 2020 net impact versus 2019 was that restaurants were down about 28% in terms of business. And if you sort of extrapolate that, um, that's about $108 billion in lost revenue for restaurants in 2020 versus 2019. We have about 29 billion that's been earmarked for restaurants in the relief bill, which means that there's gonna be a pretty significant gap between you know what the industry uh, lost and what's being offered up in relief so the relief is great but it doesn't close that gap entirely and the question then becomes how will that money actually be accessed right so if you have a five million dollar cap per location uh, that means that some places might get a lot of money and maybe some other places perhaps that money runs out before we get to those other restaurants that uh, would have liked to have gotten help too I think we saw some of this stuff when we had PPP initially, where um, places that were really good at you know, filling out applications and were ahead of the curve and maybe had the resources to do that and were having you know, really great attorneys were able to get loans um, faster. So the question is, will this happen with this restaurant relief too? You know, who's gonna be able to successfully access the funds? How long before it runs out? Because it does not cover the entire industry. It covers about a quarter of the industry, of the restaurant industry's losses. Um, last year. And then think about that. If we're um, sort of making whole um, your 2020 revenue versus 2019, for those places that did not do things like uh, rely heavily on third party delivery, where you're paying, um, you know, a commission on those sales and your cost of sales goes up, does it actually sort of benefit places that did not go the delivery route? because now they haven't really raised their expenses that much and they'll get essentially all the revenue back if they get their application in and it gets approved. So uh, there's a lot of unknowns here and I guess we'll see how this sort of shakes out. Um, I don't know if they're gonna say, hey, we're gonna um, award people, uh, award restaurants a grant in the full amount that they're applying for. Um, and then when that mon money runs out, it runs out. Or if they say, hey, everyone's gonna get you know, 10% of what you apply for first so that everyone gets something. Then we do another round and everyone gets another 10% so that it's not that we don't end up with a system where some restaurants get 100% and some restaurants get zero. Uh, I, I'm not aware of what the exact plan is. So I'd invite, if any of you know, uh, we'd love to see that in chat. Um, so um, we'll, we'll update you as we get more information, but if, again, if any of you are insiders or follow uh, this political stuff uh, more than I do, uh, we would love to hear what you have to say about this too. Okay, so feel free to chat. Um, let's go and talk about some of the latest COVID stats. So there's not a whole lot to, to say in the last um, couple of weeks. We've seen basically a uh, continued sort of flattening of people's concern around COVID. It's uh, statistically about the same as where it was in that 60 to you know, mid 60s range. Uh, hasn't really changed that much. And the same can be true of the percentage of people that say they are definitely avoiding eating out. We're sort of in that 
uh, low to mid 40s number too. So not a big change from the previous period. And again, that question about, hey, do you think that this is more of an economic crisis or a public health crisis? Uh, again, things are basically flat. So uh, we'll see what happens as time moves on, but it seems like we're sort of in just sort of a holding period right now in terms of people's perception about um, how scared they are of COVID personally, um, if they're willing to, to go out to eat or not willing to go out to eat. Um, uh, but I think as you see more places open up and social proof starts kicking in and it's like, hey, everyone's starting to go out to restaurants, more of these restaurants have more capacity, uh, we should hopefully start seeing some of these numbers move. A couple of other quick stats that we thought we'd share with you is um, about almost three quarters, uh, between two thirds and three quarters of people in the country think that right now is not the right time uh, for their states to end uh, those mask mandates. So uh, that's a fairly clear majority. And uh, about two thirds believe that restaurants should not yet be allowed to open at 100% capacity just yet. So they're certainly not saying, hey, let's not get there. They're just saying, uh, I'm probably a little more comfortable with 50, 75, some other number currently. Um, so I wanted to pivot us and think about what the future sort of holds, right? Uh, and you know, a lot of the work that we do and a lot of the work that I think all of you do is around what stuff do we bring onto the menu or into the store, but just what does innovation look like um, during COVID and post COVID? Um, so in addition to Mike, we have Emily uh, who manages some of our uh, innovation tools, as well as Linda, who is like a great, great expert on menu innovation uh, that'll be sharing some thoughts with us too. But I thought I could maybe get us started with just some of the things that we have observed. So uh, we have a system called SCORES and what SCORES basically does, this is, SCORES is for restaurants, right? What SCORES basically does is it looks at um, restaurants and convenience stores and every single new item that gets brought onto a menu, whether it's an LTO, a brand new permanent item or a returning item like the Shamrock Shake, it looks at all of that and it provides consumer detail and a consumer reaction to each. But you can also use stores just to look at, you know, how often things are getting launched or brought onto the menu. So we went back uh, about, what, five, a little over, uh, almost six years, five and a half years or something, um, to see how many new menu launches there are every single month going back to January of 2015. And, uh, and here's what those numbers look like. So you can sort of see the general range is among the top chains, there's usually between maybe like 300 or so to upwards of 500 new menu item launches each month. Then all of a sudden we hit COVID and the number dropped precipitously, as you could imagine. But we've since recovered pretty quickly after just a couple of months, right? By the time we got to into the early summer, we're starting to track to levels that were, you know, not on the high side of things, but not dramatically different than what we've seen historically. And now as we're um, heading into, you know, to March and April and beyond, we're basically back into that sort of trading band where we're up to about 350. Uh, we got up to almost 400 new items in the month of January. So innovation is still happening. New menu launches are still happening. This is um, not like we've seen in some past periods where things just sort of fell off a cliff and we weren't seeing new things come onto the menu. Uh, chains are in fact bringing new things onto the menu. And as a point of contrast, I wanted to maybe take a look and we've shown this previously, but I think it's a really good guide for us. I want to sort of show what 2008 looked like, right? So as we came out of the financial crisis, what was going on? What, how, did, how did the restaurant industry react? Well, one way of looking at this is what percentage of all new menu items that were launched at restaurants over time were combo and value meals, basically price promotions of some sort. And you could see that um, as we were coming out of the financial crisis in 2009, uh, one of the ways that the industry did this was they said, hey, we're gonna focus really heavily on price. And, and, uh, and value items or combos of some sort or the you know eat for $20 um, type of a thing. There's a huge spike that we saw over here. And this spike occurred in every segment, right? Here's the percentage of all new menu introductions, 
by segment at chain restaurants um, that were combo and value meals, right? A big spike in 2009 for QSR, for fast casual, for mid-scale restaurants, and for casual dining chains. So uh, that works great in the short run. And I think one of the lessons that we've learned leading into the uh, pandemic and early on is it works great for the short run, but you probably don't want to just keep doing that. You need real innovation if you want to be competitive in the long run. <coughs> the question is, did we adopt a short run mentality, right? Where we were sort of focused on just these combo value meals, or did we do something a little bit different? Well, let's first look at what we did again in 2009. So I'm gonna show you one line over here, like this sort of downward sloping line. If you look at um, the last uh, 10 years roughly, actually I think it's the last 15 years, what percentage of all new menu introductions on chain menus fall into each one of these food categories, right? So desserts historically are like 11.5% of all new chain menu introductions, sandwiches are 10.5%, et cetera. That's historic average. The blue line is what it looked like in 2009. And you can see 2009 had some pretty stark differences. We had a big uptick in combo and value meals. We also had upticks in other things that were sort of more entree focused. And we had downticks in things like desserts, non-alcoholic beverages, and adult beverages. So the industry's reaction coming out of the financial crisis is, hey, let's go combo value meal crazy and let's sort of change the mix of items that we're gonna bring on in the menu versus what we've done historically. <coughs> Excuse me, focusing mostly on things that are entrees and less so on things that actually add incremental check average, right? Everyone's gonna buy an entree, but not everyone's gonna get a beverage or dessert. And we actually started offering less of those items, those incremental check average things, beverages and desserts. Those are the things we really wanted to offer more of if you think about it right? Because we wanted to get people to spend more if they could. Uh, the question is, what happened this time around with COVID? Did we do the same thing we did in 2009 and shift primarily to a low price strategy as restaurants? So we can actually look at the data. You know, what did we actually do? We have a year of data to reflect upon now um, because we're deep into COVID. And I thought this is sort of interesting. So the first thing I'm going to look at is how much uh, what was the pricing of new items that we brought onto the menu over the past uh, year? And then what did, what did the, the pricing look like for the same period, essentially the year prior? So during COVID, we actually saw, for the most part, a slight increase in menu prices versus pre-COVID, like versus the year prior to COVID. So the, in, we did not make a U-turn. We did not all of a sudden say, hey, let's just price everything lower as we've debut new items on the menu. We actually continue. There's actually been a little bit of menu inflation, which is what you would normally expect. A slight uptick in the average cost of items brought on the QSR menus. Fast casual was dead even. A little bit of a downtick in mid-scale. We can talk about some of the reasons why that may have happened. And then reasonable levels of inflation, uh, menu inflation in both casual dining and C stores. So uh, we actually charged more during COVID. And if you look at that share of menu launches, so uh, I'm gonna qualify how we built this chart. It's a little bit different because we wanted to keep things as apples to apples as possible. That grayish squiggly line, actually let's start with the pink line. The pink line, we said, well, at what point would COVID thinking really have made it onto what debuts in a restaurant. We said, yeah, you know, if you're launching something in May, like COVID thinking has probably hit you at that point if you're a chain deciding what to, to, to release or promote. So if we look at the period of May through um, the end of last month, that's the pink line. This is the share of new items on menus at chains during the COVID period. And then we said, let's take those same months. So we adjust for seasonality. Um, and let's take the average of those same months, that May to February period, for the preceding four years. So we could be as apples to apples as we can. And you could see where these two lines go. And there are a little bit of a peak, a little bit of a valley, but nothing nearly as extreme as we saw in 2009. 
And we don't have a crazy massive peak for things like combo and value meals. We have a menu strategy and an innovation strategy that seems to more closely reflect what restaurants have been doing. So it's not like all of a sudden we said, hey, let's not innovate around beverages uh, anymore. Let's not innovate around desserts anymore. We continue to sort of stay the course in the way around innovation, which we think is a very, very positive thing. This is what's gonna get consumers coming back in the restaurant because as we know, the thing that people most want when they go to a restaurant is to basically get stuff they couldn't normally have at home. So it's good that we did not essentially dumb the menu down. We reduced the menu because we, at the beginning, we went from a full-size menu to a half-size menu just so we could um, work operationally, but we did not dumb the menu down for consumers. And that will pay dividends, we think, in the long run. And I think that's sort of the core message here is that we actually got smart about the menu and we continued innovating as an industry, which is a little bit different than what we saw in the prior decade coming out of the financial crisis. And this should pay dividends for us. So uh, here's another way of thinking about this. One of the things that we do in scores too is for every new thing that launches on a menu, we ask consumers you know, a number of questions. Uh, would you be interested in ordering this? Do you think it's unique? And a few other um, questions too that we'll cover in a moment. But here's the perceived uniqueness of new items that have launched uh, at major chains um, for the last number of years, right? And you, we might have come into this saying, you know what? I wonder if chains have said, hey, let's, gonna, let, let's focus on just really common stuff and get rid of the uniqueness and just do like really basic items that we bring on in the menu. But that hasn't been true, right? Consumers for the most part have said the items that, are, that have been released during that COVID period that you sort of see here in yellow, they are just as unique now as they ever have been, which I think is a really positive thing too. Right. Keep in mind all the people that have been locked up um, at home for months and months and months eating the, the same things over and over again. The last thing you want to do if you go out to a restaurant is eat the same thing you've been eating at your house for a long time. The fact that we've maintained and perhaps even grown the level of uniqueness of the items that we launched during COVID is a very, very positive sign. So with that, I'd actually like to bring in um, Linda to teach us a little bit about what is a good process for you know, building a, a menu or a concept pipeline that's gonna be successful in the long run? And uh, Linda, I did a, a, my, a minor introduction of you earlier, but do you wanna maybe just give us a 30 second background on you know, what you've been doing and, and, and your history, and then let's get into the thick of the idea process you've helped us with. Sure, yeah. Um... Basically, you know, my entire career is as consumer research, um, mostly food, um, and um, most recently prior to Data Central, um, was working with Taco Bell, as you mentioned, um, and, and as, as I think most of us know, they are an innovation machine. They definitely have a process down that um, really helps them to launch. They're launching, you know, 10 products a year, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, after leaving um, Taco Bell, I continued to work with some other um, companies doing the same thing and working with them to kind of develop um, a process um, to help, again, to, to, to innovate. Um, the idea, I think what's most important as we kind of go into this is as you look at the brands that are just kind of killing it, um, during COVID or even, you know, prior to COVID, um, they do have a process. And, you know, we can talk about different processes and what works for, you know, one organization versus another, how fast you need to get to market, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is, regardless of what that process is, there is a process. Um, it's, it's, it's not, I mean, and, you know, I mean, I certainly can, you can throw something up against the wall and have some successes. What you want is everything to be a success. Um, and you want to, you know, obviously, and if you're working on this project or product to launch, you're not working on that product. You don't want to leave money on the table, et cetera. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. Um, and so we, you know, Jack and I, as I came into Data Central, we kind of talked about um, a variety of different organizations that we've had, um, you know, that we've been lucky enough to work with in, in, in talking about the process and developing the process. And we kind of ultimately, um, put it into um, this this idea of idea um, and just um, a, a process. And it's, it's basically a stage gate process. I think we've all worked with stage gate. And I think the biggest thing about any process is 
developing it, developing what works for your organization and sticking to it. Um, and in our case, like I said, it, it, it's idea and the idea of, you know, you start off with this innovation, you develop the product, you evaluate it, and then you activate it. Yeah, so uh, how does this play out? Well, it, it's, it's, it's interesting. And, and once again, as you look at this, you know, from brand to brand, these numbers on the right side may or may not make sense to you. So, you know, don't get caught up in the actual numbers. The broad idea is that you start out with a lot of ideas and ultimately you start to hone them in so that you have whatever is the appropriate number for your organization to launch. Like, you know, at Taco Bell, again, we had, um, at any given time and given year, roughly 10 um, calendar launches a year. Some of them will be rehits, et cetera. But, um, and for us to get there, we started at about 500 broad ideas. And I, I know that that number seems super scary, but they, every idea is also not, not a good idea. Um, so it wasn't that we started out with 500 awesome ideas. We'd start with this inspiration, you know, which would be, um, you know, an ideation, an innovation session, an immersion, whatever issue, you know, whatever product um, uh, calendar, um, the uh, product that we are trying to fulfill, were we trying to, you know, do um, kind of a healthy product, or we kind of trying to do a big eat, et cetera, et cetera. But nonetheless, we'd start out and really cast the net wide. Um, you know, then you end up with 500 or whatever your number is, um, ideas. As I said, many of those ideas are terrible ideas. Some of them you can obviously weed out, but then that's where we'd start doing um, what we called uh, a preliminary idea screen. We fondly called it internally a piss test, which just kind of cropped us up because we're data nerds. Um, but anyway, um, at the end of the day, that was where we'd start really weeding out. And the intention of that was really to start weeding out the dogs, to start identifying what were the good solid products to start putting efforts and thought and attention to. Um, and, and we've all had this, you know, the, these ideas come from all over, you know, I don't know. I, we've all had the CMO comes in and says, hey, I was at the grocery store and I saw something on an end cap and we should do it. And, and you know, th th this is the place where we'd start to go, well, maybe that's a good idea. Maybe it's not. Um, and, and start to go through this preliminary idea screen. Um, from then, depending on, um, what um, the product was, we'd start to refine it. And we'd go, you know, we, we, we'd kick out a bunch of stuff out of the preliminary idea screen. Those that seem like good ideas, we start to refine. Does it work for our brand? Is it something that we can talk about? How do we talk about it? For example, when we started doing breakfast, we spent years on breakfast. You know, just how do we talk about it? Obviously, you know, uh, the McDonald's and the Starbucks are the big gorillas in the room, um, you know, and, and now many other brands have come on as well as being, um, you know, powerhouses and breakfast, you know, so the reality is that's a perfect example where we would refine was something that just wasn't necessarily in the consumer's mindset for, for us. Um, you know, everything does not need to go through that refinement. The next version of a grilled stuff burrito you know, didn't need to go there. Ultimately, we would then decide what we were, um, and this, at this point, we're still kind of in the theoretical stage. Um, and, and the concept test is kind of where the rubber hit the road. We are going to start working on this. We're going to start talking to our suppliers about this. We're going to um, put development efforts towards this. We're going to start thinking, you know, talking to the consumer uh, again as necessary about what's the unique, unique selling proposition associated with this. The concept test was the stage where we then greenlit things to become live in our organization. Um, and it was, um, you know, basically once it came out of concept test, we knew that, that, you know, that it was a good idea for us. I mean, it had gone through a lot of rigor and the concept test um, had rigor associated to it as well. Um, and and I, I, you know, I go back to the reality is when you have 500 broad ideas or 250 or 75 or whatever the number is, you can't work on all of those. You've got to start saying, what am I going to work for that's going to have success for my organization? Um, and I always say that the, num the two things as an organization, I almost, you know, you can talk about all the other things you do. The two things you have to assess for your organization is, is it a good idea for my brand? And then the, sec the, the next one, which is under the store test is, 
does it taste good? It can be the best idea ever. And it's, 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 you know, wonderful and everyone's going to love it. And when you, when you actually create it, it doesn't deliver on expectations or perhaps it does, but the, the cost of sales associated with it is way too high. The portion size is too low. You know, it's spicy enough. It's not spicy enough. It's cheesy enough. It's not cheesy enough. Um, it just flat out doesn't taste good. It's too salty. All those things that, you know, um, that as we sit and we develop in the, in the kitchen, um, we think it tastes good, but ultimately does the consumer think it tastes good? Um, so that's, you know, the, the two things in my opinion is, is it a good idea? And are you delivering on that good idea? And that really falls in that, that green section right there. Once you've determined, once you've gotten past that stage gate, then you're, you're, you're ready to, to decide how you want to launch it. You know, obviously, in, in bigger brands, you may then do some ad testing. Um, you know, if you're going to market test, you know, and make sure that the ad, the communication of the ad actually, um, you know, works with the product, et cetera. And then ultimately, um, you know, we would launch things. The beauty of this process as well, especially when you start with the, the, the 500, the X number of broad ideas is, there was another um, uh, intent here is to always have a pantry. We always had a pantry. If all of a sudden, you know, I don't know, um, mad cow disease hit and no one was buying beef, we had a chicken product ready to go. Take, you know, the, the, the beef off the calendar, throw the chicken in. Um, you know, so um, ultimately, and that would, you know, it might've only gone through concept testing. And we, we kept, you know, we always kept a scorecard of, of pantry items that were, um, in various degrees of readiness. Yeah, so I wonder, if, Linda, we could talk about two of the testing phases, mm -hmm. right? When you screen ideas and then you test them more fully. And uh, we have here some of the metrics that are important in each one of these. Maybe, can you give us the 30 second version of each? Yes, yes. So, you know, we, we um, at, at Data Essential and, um, um, have our express idea screen. And that's kind of, again, um, often the, the knockout round. Um, it, it, it helps you to determine ultimately, is this a good idea? Should we be pursuing this? Does this, you know, does, 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 is there any consumer interest in this? And, and the things here that are, are you know, and, and you can see there's purchase interest, uniqueness, frequency, and draw. Um, to me, you know, and it also depends on what you're doing, but purchase interest and draw. Am I interested in it? Am I going to drive past four other um, restaurants to go there? Um, and that's, you know, and like I said, it's not that uniqueness and frequency are important, but those are the two big ones. When you then go into the full concept test, which to me is the big place where, you know, again, it's the green light for me to start working and putting resources towards something. Now we've added in, is it, you know, not only is it a good idea, is it a good idea for my brand? You know, is it, does it fit, if it's a value item or not, does it fit within the value that it should fit? Um, you know, and, and then um, also, uh, you know, again, you get likes and uniqueness and frequency. And then importantly, and I think this is one of the most underutilized um, pieces of research is likes and dislikes. If you want to see passion for your product, read the likes and dislikes. Is the like, yeah, tastes good, or is it like, hell yeah, when can I get this? And, and consumers will tell you what they like and dislike. Um, about a product. So don't, don't uh, you know, if, if you have the chance and, and, and often there's a lot of them, but some of them are really funny as well. <laughs> it's actually fun reading uh, open ends. Absolutely. So, uh, so I actually wanted to maybe just have Emily come in and show how some of the stuff is brought to life. We now have uh, many chains that use uh, our scores platform as their primary way of evaluating concepts and we've tried to sort of automate things to make things just much easier far more standardized that helps you sort of manage that process that linda just talked about um emily i think you probably found maybe some interesting examples that we could go over so i'm going to actually just launch this real quick uh, tell me where you'd like me to 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 go emily yeah, well, I was thinking for today it would be fun to do an item that I think everyone will recognize. Um, hasn't been that long since the start of the chicken war. So why don't we go to the infamous one? The first one, I know we're probably still in the midst of chicken wars technically, but um, the, the beginning would be the, the Popeyes. Can you search in Popeyes? Yeah, if I could type uh, it, I can. Let's see. <laughs> and then click on the chain. Yeah, there you go. Um, 
And this was all the way back, like so August is, of yeah. 19. So this is everything that Popeyes has launched along with what consumers think about it. Uh, so let's go back. Yeah. Where's that? Oh, is it's this like it? August of 19. Is this there it, it is. the chicken sandwich? Okay. Yeah. 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 So as you can see, I mean, it scores really, really well. It's like, uh, we call it a superstar. And if you click into it, you can sort of see why, right? Um, it's kind of a generally broadly well-beloved item uh, across the board. You can see it across the metrics, right? So high, really high unbranded PI, really high branded PI, average uniqueness. And you can see if you click on the radio button, Jack, on um, next to uniqueness, you can see uh, how, where this item is <laughs> um, compared to so the, the item is not that unique, but the purchase intent is extraordinarily strong. And it looks like value is thought to be. Value is huge. Really good mm -hmm. Which gets and it a really, does, really high nice score overall. Yeah, I mean, it, it does really well for frequency and draw. And as Linda was saying, right, these are great indicators. So frequency is a measure of like loyalty. You know, would I come get this all the time? And then draw is a great measure of perhaps whether or not it's um, a visitation driver, right? So I would actually would go say, out of it. And getting a 99 is hard. That's not an easy hard. thing to do, right? Really hard. Yeah. Um, so this is an outstanding item. The cool thing also you can look at, scroll down a bit, I can show you that it did well broadly um, across the board, not just in metrics, but also by demographic, right? So if you, yeah, expand this little view, you can see that sure it did better with men versus women, um, but, but it's across with generations. Yeah. Those are really high numbers across the board. Across really. the board. Yep. And so it was just a standout winner. It was even, you know, popular across user types, heavy users, light users of the chain. Yep. Um, but then if you, so again, while we're on the topic of chicken sandwiches, if you look at another chain's chicken sandwich, that took a slightly different spin on it. Um, let's look at, I love this one. Let's look at KFC if you wanna search for KFC items. At the top there, you can just type it in. Yep, there we go. Yeah, it looks like there's a little bit of a lag in my screen tree. So we have 101 menu launches from KFC. Which one am I looking at? So, there's a couple of fun ones. I love the Beyond Fried Chicken one you're seeing at the top of the screen. And then if you scroll uh, uh, there on the left, February, 2020, oh. the Kentucky Fried Chicken Donuts Basket Meal. And there's um, the Donut Sandwich as well, the chicken sandwich. Yeah. I open up the Donuts Basket Meal one. So you should see that in a second. Yeah, so they took a slightly different approach, right? So again, it's like this, um, premium chicken, but they went with, instead of the broad, broad appeal, they went with uniqueness, a little bit whimsical, a little bit fun. We all know chicken and waffles. Let's do donut um, and check in here. So we can see that rather than superstar, they've got specialty appeal as their rating um, or bucket. So and moderate, moderate popularity in terms of purchase, mm -hmm. but ultra, ultra unique, which makes it a little bit more of a specialty item. Yeah. yeah, and the super fun thing that you can do, again, scroll down, you'll see sort of why, right? So here they're pretty clearly targeting younger generations. Gen Z and millennials did really well, um, oh, yeah. less well among boomers, understandably. Like, so they're really able to get some niche audience um, appeal and yep. also probably generate some good buzz. Right, so it's a slightly different approach, but also really uh, viable. I, I say we uh, throw some fire onto the chicken wars, and in chat, uh, please specify which of the two sandwiches you would personally prefer, <laughs> the Popeyes one or the donut one from KFC. Um, I should add, I, we're looking at the basket meal right now, but they do have the the one where it's chicken in the middle and donuts. The don the, bun. The, the bun is a donut. Mm -hmm. oh, that's yeah. So and same we, thing, it's specialty appeal in the same yeah. way. So let's actually break this apart a little bit. So here are the things that you sort of learn when you do a, a concept test the right way. I mean, you have your KPIs, right? How do things sort of score in these area, various areas? 
Then you have an overall score, which is essentially a composite that takes all these factors together and, and rebalances them. Then we have this thing that we call viability, which is what is the purpose of this item or what should this purpose of this item be on your menu? And we have um, a couple of things to think about over there. I wanna start with the KPIs. And one of the reasons that we've done this where we use sort of the star system is uh, because, actually, let me just give everyone like a really quick stats lesson, right? So I think most people are probably used to seeing something like this. This is a normal distribution. And uh, all those funny looking Greek letters at the bottom, um, the, that thing looks like a U, that's a uh, mu, and that's basically means the mean. So that's the average number in a series, um, in, a, in, a, in a set of data. And then that thing that looks like that O with the little squiggle, that's a standard deviation. So it's saying, hey, um, if you have and if you're average within the population and you look at the standard deviation, how much sort of people or things vary in a data set, if you're within one standard deviation to the left and one standard deviation to the right, so if you're within a total of uh, one deviation from the mean in either direction, 68% of all things fall in that range. 95% of all things fall within two standard deviations to the left or to the right of the mean. And 99.7% of all things fall within three standard deviations to the left or the right of the mean. Uh, probably the easiest way to do this is just illustrate this with something that we can all relate to, which is height, right? So this is uh, US data over here. So this is how tall people are in the US. The average height of, of, of men in the US is 70 inches. For women, it's 64 and a half inches. For men, the standard deviation of height is three inches. For women, it's two and a half inches. And the question is, um, think about how tall you are and where you fall into this. So 68%, right? That 68% we saw of the US population falls within one standard deviation of the mean. So that, if you're a man, that means 68% of men are between 67 inches and 73 inches tall. For women, 68% are between 62 and 67, you know, five foot two to five foot seven. We got another standard deviation, two standard deviations. Now we're at between 64 and 76 inches for men. So 95% of people in this in this country, uh, if you're a guy, you're between five foot four and six foot four. If you're above six foot four, you're pretty exceptional, right? For women, you're between four eleven and a half and five nine and a half. And then at the outside boundaries, 99.7% of men in this country are within three standard deviations of that 70 inch mean, which means that 99.7% of men are between five foot one and six seven. If you're six foot eight, you are like a unicorn, basically. For women, um, you're almost certainly gonna be between four foot nine and six foot oh. So now you can sort of see where you are. And we needed to take these principles and apply it to how we look at concept data. Because that normal curve has that big bump in the middle, like a 2% differential in whether someone wants to order something near the mean is much less meaningful than a 2% differential towards the outer tails where you have less activity. And if we look at this, the metrics of, again, scores, I think we've tested over 40,000 items in scores over the last few years. Every single thing that's launched on a menu at chains. And if we look at purchase intent, it follows basically a normal distribution. This is the average level of purchase interest across all things that have launched on a menu, and it follows a normal shaped curve. If we think about uniqueness, how unique are things, it also sort of follows a normal shaped curve. The question is, are there things that don't follow a normal distribution? And there is one, there's one major metric that doesn't, and it's this notion of value. You see how this chart looks different than the last two? The last two were that normal distribution, that's sort of like that height chart that we saw before. But when it comes to, is this menu item a good value for the dollar? It's different in this case, right? You have a much taller tail to the right. And it's because of all the value items and price promos that are offered. Right, it's really hard to create something like ultra unique unless you just want to do something totally, totally crazy so you don't get a really thick tail to the right. But we do so much stuff around, you know, dollar ninety nine, ninety nine cent, one dollar items, you know, three ninety nine combo, those types of things, that the industry has a pretty thick value tail to the right. Um, and here's an interesting stat: 
If you look at the top 3% of items that are perceived to be have, have the best value on a menu, the average menu price of those items is $1.97, right? Compared with the average menu price of all items is I think like $8.12. So we have a lot of value-based activity still, but not specifically because of COVID, it has always been like this. We're looking at the totality of all data over the last several years. The other thing that's sort of worth knowing over here is we have a thing that we call menu viability, which is in aggregate, what should the function of this item be on your menu? And there's sort of five different things that it could be. Is the item a superstar? Is it something that everyone wants to order and it's really unique? Or is it a volume driver where maybe a lot of people want it, but you know it's not all that unique for you, but you're gonna sell a lot of it. Is it a specialty or niche item, sort of like the donut chicken sandwich that Emily just showed us? Or is it something that might be a lower potential? Or is it something you should maybe just consider that you want to refine to get it just right? And the question is, what makes something a superstar? Um, superstars are pretty rare, right? You don't get many things that really qualify as a superstar, but we found some things that you want to keep in mind um, that sort of elevate things to superstar status. So we looked at the totality of things that make it into that superstar realm, and they share some things in common. One, as it relates to menu items, they're clearly described and totally unambiguous. You will never run into a case where you're not even sure what the thing is, right? It's, this is clearly a sandwich. This is clearly X. This is clearly why the ambiguity is taken out of it. Two, when you have really unique flavors or the really new on-trend stuff that makes things, make things interesting, especially things that are not known to consumers very well, you usually want to tuck those in the description of the item as opposed to the name of the item. You want to put, um, you know, you want something familiar in the name, but something that also makes it a little bit more interesting. But the really, you know, one-off, you know, sort of newer flavors that most people haven't really heard of yet, keep those in the description and those items will perform better. And three, they follow this thing that we call safe experimentation, which is, hey, it's going to be something that's that people want that uh, that's new and unique, but at the same time, it's not too scary for them, right? There's something safe about it as well. And we've talked about this many, many times. The one thing that does this better than anything else is this principle that we call fusebiquity, which is to take a ubiquitous platform like burgers or sandwiches or pizza or pasta that everyone loves and twist that up with new inspirations either from around the world or other new flavors that are emerging on menus, right? The, the Korean fried chicken sandwich as opposed to just the fried chicken sandwich as an example. Um, this is your shortcut recipe to creating superstar menu items, whether you're a chain or a restaurant and you're creating new things for your menu, or if you're a supplier to the industry, collaborating with your customers on bringing new things to their menu too. Fusebiquity is a shortcut secret to success. And one thing that we've noticed, and this is surprising to us, if we look at the totality of everything that has launched, actually launched on chain restaurant menus, you could see what the average level of purchase intent and uniqueness is. We compared that to things that have been sort of privately tested also in our scores environment. So these are things that are not yet on the menu. These are ideas. And you would normally expect that these ideas would be more unique than things that have actually launched, right? Because these are still just in that idea stage. But you would expect that the ideas would be lower purchase intent because they haven't gone through multiple rounds of vetting. What we found is that they are actually more unique as you would expect, the ideas, those scores, concept tests. But amazingly, the purchase interest in those items is also higher, which is sort of, you, you, you know, you have to come up with ways of explaining what's actually causing this. Why would a brand new idea that has not yet been vetted score better in terms of consumer interest than products that have actually made it onto the menu and have been vetted. Well, these things are actually fairly significant, right? Compared to publicly launched menu items that have actually made it onto the menu, concepts tested in scores as a platform score a half standard deviation better in purchase intent and 0.7 standard deviations better in uniqueness. To put it in plain context, that is basically the statistical equivalent of you growing magically two inches taller. Like I'm on the short side of that one standard deviation from the mean for the average man's height in the country. I would kill to be able to just tack two inches onto my height. I've tried like platform shoes and all those other things. 
None of that stuff works. I would just like to have the extra two inches. You can actually do that. And we ask ourselves, well, how is it? Like what's actually driving this? And I think the explanation is sort of simple. One, if you're testing things in scores, you're probably following some sort of a process. You're gaining institutional knowledge about what types of things work and what doesn't. You're bringing better ideas to the table. Uh, two, and this is maybe a little bit self-serving, but we think it's totally true. You're probably also more likely to be using, and we know this is a fact, other data central tools that help you understand trends, right? You're essentially pre-validating your ideas saying, oh, what's, you know, is Gochujang still growing, right? What's going on with Romulod? And all those things get baked into that initial idea. And it is remarkable. The average idea scores better than the average thing that makes it onto the menu. So this is again why process is so important and why trend tools are really important too. The last thing I wanna leave us with, I know we're gonna go over a minute, is it's really important to calibrate things, right? Average purchase intent across everything that's launched on the menu is about 44%, but it's higher for certain groups. Men rate things higher than women a little bit, right? Gen Z and millennials rate things higher than boomers do. People in the Midwest rate things lower than people in other parts of the country. People with kids, maybe because they just want anything, um, rate things much higher than people without kids. And you can sort of see these patterns. So you have to adjust for this, right? And it changes on a category basis too. The average level of purchase interest for appetizers and sizes of, and sizes of 43, but for burgers, it's a 48. For alcoholic beverages, it's a 33. So you have to take all of that into consideration too so that you're not comparing apples with apples. You cannot compare a beer against a burger and look at the numbers similarly. You have to remember that your starting point for a beer is lower than your starting point for a burger. And there's some things that you could do too. You have cheat codes that are available to you. This is the simplest one. Bacon is a culinary cheat code. On average, items that have bacon score 5% better, which is significant, than items without bacon. This is across tens of thousands of items. This is not a small number. There are many other cheat codes too that are revealed to you when you start playing with a platform like scores. So in scores, you can actually look at the average score of items that have certain ingredients or flavors in them. Um, I know we talked about plant-based a little bit in the last webinar, but I don't wanna forget all of our great friends that are in the protein business and uh, bacon is just one of those cheat codes that's available to you. You put bacon in something, the appeal level just goes up. The last thing I wanna leave us with, and I apologize we went over, is if we look at what's happened with the way people wanna eat stuff, that you know, new menu items that launched, would you, do you wanna have it to go? Do you wanna have it for dining? Do you wanna have it for delivery? You see some peaks and valleys, right? And it sort of makes sense that um, things like breakfast pastries, breakfast sandwiches, and non-alcoholic beverages, these are all things that people say, oh, I totally get this is more of a to-go item. But in general, that blue to go line is higher than the green, you know, dine in line almost across the board. And it wasn't as exaggerated like this pre COVID. This has become uh, an outcome and a symptom of COVID. It used to be that, the, you know, half the items were the green line was hot, was taller and half the blue was taller. Now the blue is taller in almost every case. And there's just a few sort of edge cases where the green line is taller, where people say, you know what, if it's a seafood dish, or if I'm having like a, a cocktail, yeah, I got it. I really want to have that while I'm dining in. But this is different than what we saw before. Previously, more of these categories people thought of as primarily dine-in. The other thing to keep in mind is delivery does poorly in every case other than pizza. Regardless, of, unless unless you're talking about pizza, regardless of what the food category is, people are more likely to say, I want to have that item for to go or for dine in. And remember, we're not asking people at the category level, we're testing this at the item level. So across almost 4,000 new items that have launched during COVID, we asked people, how would you like to have this item? And we sort of grouped them by category over here. We need to do better with delivery or the appeal of items for delivery, right? How do we make items that people say, oh yeah, I can totally see myself getting that delivered and it'll come out great. How do we make more of these things look like that average that we see for pizza. Uh, we had a poll, but we're going way over time. We'll maybe save it for next time. Uh, I want to apologize for going so far over and uh, just remind you that if you want to learn more about scores or learn more about how you could bring a real concept process into your operation uh, or into the way you engage with customers, we're here for you. We have a, another webinar on April 1st. It's our April Fool's webinar. We promise 
most of the information will be legitimate. It's not going to be all made up for April Fools or anything crazy like that. It'll be good. We're going to get back to some coverage on COVID, and we will see you then.